I'm going to take your energy right there. <laughs> We're going to talk today about building a movement, about the lessons that we can take in looking at the past so we can draw wisdom as we move forward. It's almost like driving with that rear view mirror. You need, you're informed by what has happened as you try to figure out how to move forward on the path ahead. As we have this conversation, there are many of us here in the room, but we can share what we experience and learn in the room with those outside. So we welcome you to use, as my mother calls, the Twitter, to share information, um, insights that you hear, and please use the hashtag TFA25, and the session is called Building a Movement. When you sat down, you probably also noticed that there were some white cards on your chairs. We want you to participate in the conversation. So as you think about questions that you want to ask of the panelists, please write those down and pass those toward the center. I had prepared remarks that I was going to share with you. And then, you know, in life, every so often something happens and you are required to take a left turn. And that happened to me today because I, I did a morning session, and in between that session and this one, I attended a homegoing service for someone. It was just held three blocks from here. A dear friend of mine lost her mother, and I was able to attend the service. This was a 90-year-old woman, and she was an educator. And she was a movement woman. She helped build the movement here in this area. She was from South Carolina. She helped push this country forward in a very elegant way. And so in honor of her and her story, I'm tossing out what I was planning to share with you because there were three things that I took from her homegoing ceremony that I think are instructive for us as we think about this conversation. She was 90 years old. And that was a generation that had to plan carefully for the future. They had to plan carefully to do even simple things. She grew up in South Carolina. So if you wanted to go downtown, you had to plan carefully how you would get downtown, what roads you could take. If you had to make water, you had to know where you could do that because downtown was filled with buildings that had signs on them. Signs that didn't direct you to use the restroom that you see today. Signs that said, some of you can use this restroom and some of you can't. So they had to plan carefully. And in the movement, they had to plan carefully. If you think about all of the documentaries that you see and the films that you see about the movement, sometimes it makes it look so easy. Know that people were able to push this country forward because there was so much careful planning. There was training. There were sessions where people learned how to turn the other cheek in the face of hatred, learned how to use timing, learned how to find reservoirs of courage even when they felt like they were at the end of their rope. If you were at the end of the rope, what do you have to do? Hold on tight and pray until you could start climbing again. They were a generation that planned. They were also a generation that learned how to improvise. In her homegoing, sermon uh, in, in the service, the, the, the homily uh, included a story that I want to share with you because it spoke volumes about that generation and about the movement that they built in that generation. For all the planning, they knew that there were always speed bumps on the road. There were always diversions. There were always things that they couldn't expect, and they had to learn how to deal with that. And they told a story. Um, a story was shared about Wynton Marsalis. You know who Wynton Marsalis is, the trumpeter, right? He's very exacting, if you know of anything about him. He is a perfectionist. He is an utter perfectionist. And he was at the Village Vanguard. This was in 2004. Have any of you been to the Village Vanguard? Normally, he's playing in big halls. In this case, he was playing in a small, smoky jazz club. And he was playing a beautiful rendition of a jazz standard called I Don't Have a Ghost of a Chance of Getting Close to You. You know that song? He played a beautiful version of the song, and when he got to the end, he was able to use his trumpet in such a way that it, the trumpet almost created the lyrics of the song. And he built up to this beautiful crescendo, and then there was this moment of silence. And everyone in the Village Vanguard was much like you are today, right now, just taking that in, savoring it, this beautiful moment of silence. And then something happened, someone's cell phone went off. And it was one of those happy, chirpy, doo-doo-doo kind of cell phone rings. 
Now remember I told you that Wynton Marcellus was an exacting man, so you can imagine the look on his face when that happened. One eyebrow went up, apparently, and then the other. Everyone started to sort of snicker, and then he started to lose the room. They continued with their conversation. They began picking up their glasses. You could hear the clinking of glasses. The person who did this was so mortified that they ran out of the room. Wynton Marsalis put down his trumpet for a few beats, and then he picked it back up. And he started to play a rhythm that captured the happy, chirpy cell tone, the cell phone ring, and he did it perfectly. And then he, did, he, he kind of took it in a different direction, and he added a little bit of syncopation, and he played that and then brought it back to the song that he was originally playing and brought it back to the rhythm that he was trying to share with his audience and brought it back to that moment with that beautiful crescendo and he did it once again and he reached that crescendo and there was that moment of silence and this time no one's phone rang. He took a setback and he made it into a comeback. He had to improvise and that was something that that generation also had to do. They had to plan and they had to improvise but there was one other thing that I think that I think struck me in the most significant way is that in a generation where so many of us want immediate gratification, we want to see things immediately, we want to add water and stir, we want to look for information and it's always at our fingertips, we want to see evidence of that thing that we're working for, that generation that, whose shoulders we stand upon now whether, whatever movement they happened to be fighting for, if they were fighting for civil rights, if they were fighting for marriage rights, if they were fighting for land rights or environmental rights or the right to wear dreadlocks or a mohawk to work, whatever right they were fighting for, they were fighting for something that they couldn't imagine seeing in their own lifetime. To imagine the things that we now take for granted would be almost folly for them. That not far from here, a black family lives in the White House. That here in the convention center, as you look around the room, and I'm gonna invite you to do just that right now, look to your right, look to your left, look behind you, you see a tapestry of people, a tapestry of experiences, of backgrounds, of faith traditions all represented here. Not that long ago, within my lifetime, and I choose to, to, to claim that I'm not that old, but within my lifetime, I know that when people gathered in buildings like this, a lot of women weren't there, and certainly not a lot of people of color. They could barely imagine this, but yet they fought every day. They pushed every day. They believed in something that they weren't sure that they would ever see evidenced. So I want you to think about those three things, planning, improvisation, and believing in something even if you can't exactly imagine it. Because if you believe in it, eventually you can imagine it. And if you can imagine it, you can actually start to see the outlines of it. And when you see the outlines of it, you can get close enough that you can touch it, and then you can embody it. You can make change. And so that's what we're gonna hear about today, is the building blocks of change, the muscles that are required, the courage that is the courage that is required, the grit that is required, and sometimes the humor that is required, because sometimes you just gotta laugh to keep from crying. So to tell us a little bit more about that, Mark really is gonna come forward, and he's gonna share with us a slideshow, and then we're gonna begin our conversation. Mark? Thank you, Ms. Norris. I, I feel like I'm following the poet, so thank you. Um, We've taken, uh, working at Leadership for Educational Equity, which has done close work with Teach for America for the past few years, one of the things we have wanted to do and have been doing is trying to learn the lessons from the incredible work folks like this have been doing for the last hundred years throughout the United States. No, no, no that's right. Let me make clear, no one here is a hundred years old. That's right. So we want to take today and think about the civil rights movement in this, this country and the LGBTQ rights movement and the lessons learned. And we have taken this and we have taken a look at it and come up with what we think are key building blocks. The idea that for a movement to be strong, it has to have galvanized people in key parts of that. It has to have provocative campaigns, which this panel will talk about in many different ways. 
will have impact amplifiers, the things that take the local campaigns that we see in every community and make them bigger so that they, they multiply and have even greater impact, such as we saw with, with the marriage campaigns around the country in the last 15 years or the sit-in movement in the early 1960s. The first part's galvanized people. And as Ms. Norris said, people have to have a vision of something bigger. If we don't have a vision uh, of something where folks have a completely different life, where everyone has the opportunity to kind of live out who they can be to the best that they can be, that they can be, we can't have a movement. We have to have a galvanized base and we have to have committed allies. And a key thing to think about in that galvanized base is that every great movement, if you look at this photograph, is led by the folks who are most impacted. But it's also important to note that there have to be a core group of committed allies, folks who also share that commitment and believe in it and want to play a role in it. There's got to be a set of shared values, and we often find those in the founding civic documents of a nation, which are flawed but have part of the idea of what can be and often religious texts. And then we gotta organize resources. And one of the most important things of that is it's not just about individuals, there are organizations. There are groups of folks coming together. So that a brilliant part of the marriage campaigns that we saw were in the late part of the last decade, the decision to start to engage churches who often had been thought of to be against marriage and make them part of the force for it. Or in the civil rights movement, to take the great work that had happened with the NAACP but a group of young people said we need to be part of this and founding new organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The next part that's important is that a professor from Duke makes the comment that the framers of the Constitution rigged the U.S. political system to frustrate the ambitions of po bold policy reformers and to reward those who build consent from the ground up. Their plan succeeds to this day. We gotta start locally. It's not either or, it's both and, but if you miss the ground, you miss the movement. Then we've gotta have provocative campaigns and a key part of that is that we have to have powerful direct actions and those can be the protests we have seen, but those can also be court cases that are very strategic. So when we look at the Montgomery bus boycott, it was a boycott and it was also a court case. that the work within the campaign to get a cure for HIV AIDS involved things as creative as kiss-ins and as dramatic as die-ins. And that there's gotta be the creativity, the improvisation, the ability to act outside of the experience of the target who you're trying to change, but inside the experience of the amazing courageous leaders to act. And there's risk taking in that. Folks can lose they can lose their jobs, they can be hurt, they can die, but to live within that fear and to fight it. And there's the idea of the impact amplifiers, and this is a lesson from the marriage campaign we just saw. That our job now is to take the lessons we learned to congregations in other parts of the country that are looking to win the right to marry. I hope that the larger progressive community is beginning to understand that we need people of faith for all of our struggles once they are organized they are an incredibly powerful force for change. The key parts of that quote are take the lessons learned, as Ms. Norris said. We've got to learn from the past. The second part is that we've got to find more allies and build a stronger base because it is about building power and a force for change. So within that, there's reflection and there is knowledge sharing. A power, powerful moment of that was that Many of the folks involved in the civil rights movement were trained at a place called the Highlander Folk Center. A place that brought together folks across race and income and geography that was often attempted to be closed down and was closed down. But in the 1940s and the 1950s and the 1960s, it was a place where they were taking the lessons from earlier movements and from the labor movement and teaching folks and applying them. We also saw that in the work to try to increase the, the, the cure for HIV AIDS and also the marriage movement. So we have the idea of love wins here because there was a dramatic shift, a very intentional shift in the last 10 years to take the message from that 
understanding around rights, but as you build it broader, to think about how do you get more and more folks to vote for it. And it became a message also of love wins. This image is to show that when we talk about this, two things. One, this is messy. The narrative we learn is that it's a straight line through, but as our panel will talk about, this is always messy, and we're constantly learning. The second is that you can't do this without all of these pieces. This is not a buffet. You have to have every aspect of it to make it happen. So our hope today, or what we know, is that we have these incredibly courageous folks who can share their experiences and their lessons that we hope we can apply this in the work we're doing in many different places. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. There. Yeah. How about that? Is that better? Good. I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves briefly, and then we're going to begin our conversation. And uh, Hollis Watson, since you are directly on my left, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to the room. blessed to live for over 70 years in an attempt to fulfill a commitment that I made to my people. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you, Hollis. Um, <clears throat> okay, Mr. Mr. Watson, since your microphone wasn't on, thank you very much. Can you just tell us um, the, the first part of your bio again? First part was that, I, that I'm the youngest of 12 children born to sharecroppers who have been blessed to start an organization that's called Southern Echo and to be chairperson of the board of an organization that is the veterans of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and have lived over 70 years trying to fulfill a commitment that I made when I was 16 years old. Okay, and where in Mississippi? I live in the Jackson area, Mississippi, but I was born in Lincoln County, Mississippi, Southwest. Thank you. <laughs> Bob Zellner. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Zellner, and I was raised in LA, Lower Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> And Hollis and I, Hollis is next door in Mississippi, and we've worked together for over 55 years. My father was in the Ku Klux Klan. My grandfather was in the Ku Klux Klan. But as a student in Montgomery, Alabama, I met Martin Luther King and Mrs. Rosa Parks, and they started me on a life of crime. I, my, <laughs> my first job out of school was at Highlander Folk School, and uh, that's where I uh, learned to if I was going to do anything, join SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Thank you. <laughs> Chris Perry. Hi, I'm Chris Perry. I'm uh, born in California to two public school teachers and have been a child advocate for 25 years. And I was the plaintiff in a case in California that challenged the marriage ban. Um, and we prevailed at Supreme Court two years ago. Phil Wilson. I'm Phil Wilson. I'm the president and CEO of the Black AIDS Institute. I was born on the south side of Chicago. Uh, <laughs> and I am uh, one of the founders of ACT UP Los Angeles. Uh, and I've been living uh, with HIV and AIDS uh, for over 35 years. Thank you. 
Often when I sit down with people, um, I ask them to share something that most people don't know about themselves, but I'm gonna be more specific. Um, I've worked, worked in radio for years and we have this thing called a mic check where you have to have someone speak in front of the microphone so the engineers can work the dials and sometimes I'll ask them, when you go to the grocery store, do you use paper or plastic or what was your first summer job? But the one that's always most interesting is tell me something about you that most people don't know. So to be more specific, in your work, in the movement, tell me one aspect of the work that, that most people don't know about, whether it led to success, success, whether it led to a temporary failure, whether it was how you learned how to get over a particular challenge. If there's one piece of the work that, that, is, you know, that you're saving maybe for your memoir that most people don't know about yet, what, what would that be? And Phil, let's begin with you. Well, I'm gonna cheat a little and I'm gonna go back to the first part of your question because I think it does contribute to the work that I do. And uh, I have a group of photographs in the foyer of my house of my friends who have died from AIDS. Mm. Um, there are about eight photographs. And um, my kids used to talk about how they see dead people every day. Uh, and one of the things that I do every single day as I go down the stairs from my bedroom is I stop at that gallery of photographs and I look at each photograph and I say, I see you. I see mm. you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Chris. Um, it was actually really, really hard to stand up to the state of California and say, I don't want you to tell me I'm not valuable anymore. Um, one thing about growing up gay in California, at least for me, was just don't make a fuss. Just go along with the plan that you don't get to have certain things that other people have. Other people knew that when they fell in love, they could be married. Other people knew they could have children. Other people knew they'd be valued by their families and their community, but I never, ever thought that. And when I fell in love, I knew that I wanted to be married and then I immediately knew that I could not be. And the humiliation and the embarrassment of that as an adult woman who is doing everything you're supposed to do in your community, but pay taxes and go to PTA meetings and be a good neighbor, none of that mattered. I was still um, being treated very unfairly and everyone knew it. It was embarrassing for me and embarrassing for people who love me. So to this day, now that I am married, I look at the rings on my finger and on my wife's finger and they really represent not only a victory for us and our relationship, but for everyone else in our situation and for the kids that are gonna grow up in California and never feel what I felt growing up there, which was I'm not as good as other people. It puts you on a lower trajectory. Your whole life is lived feeling like you're less than other people. Growing up thinking you're the same as other people is a really an empowering and important thing to have in your life. And I think the kids in California that grow up there now will have that. Thank you. Bob Zellner, is there a story um, that you would like to share with us that most people, even those who've worked closely with you, don't know about your work in the movement? Well, most people don't know that my memoir has already been published. <laughs> and it's, it's called? It's called The Wrong Side of Murder Creek. It's about growing up in South Alabama. And very few people know that Spike Lee is trying to make a movie from my memoir. So uh, I hope that happens. And if there are any young actors here or directors, please let us know. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you, though, because my, my people are from Alabama also. My father's from Birmingham. And he always said that nobody gets out of Alabama without secrets in their back pocket. They don't what? Nobody gets out of Alabama without secrets in their back pocket. Oh, yeah. Because there were things that, and, you know, and, and it, it's, it's, it's perhaps, you know, we can giggle about it, but the fact is that it was a very difficult place to be and that you had to put things in your back pocket in order for you to move forward. There were things that you saw, there were things that you witnessed, there were things that you endured yeah. that you just couldn't dwell upon, otherwise you wouldn't be able to go forward. So is there anything that you want to speak to? Well, uh, very few people know that when my father quit the Ku Klux Klan, my mother was so happy, she took his robes, and well, there were five of us little boys, and she made white shirts for us to go to Sunday school in. So I went to Sunday school in recycled clan robes. <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm proud of that, but uh, I'm glad the robes got cut up. Well, you know, she gave it back to God. She did good. <laughs> <laughs> she did good. Mr. Hollis Watkins. Yeah, I briefly mentioned two. 
One is kind of like what Bob said, mine has not come out yet, but it will be coming out by the end of March. And there's a and blurb on it too. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing in reference to the civil rights movement that most people don't know is what really motivated me to get involved. And it came from some humble words that came from my father when he said, son, you always stand up for what is right, even if you are the only one standing. That, that jogged my memory and understanding where I said, if I stand up for what's right, I got to stand against all of that which is wrong. And that was the motivating force that got me involved into the civil rights movement and he told me to use the tools that you had. I had forgotten that him initially bringing me up on the stage with the family to sing when I was five years old, that my singing, the music that I was aware of, would be the most important organizing tool that I ever could say. And that's what I've been using for the last better than 50 years. I don't want to tell my age. <laughs> How much do your movements build upon each other? Do you take lessons from the civil rights movement? Are you using the playbook of the marriage equality movement? Have you looked at the land rights movement? I mean, how often do you cross-pollinate your efforts? I think that for the work that we do um, in HIV and AIDS, we certainly call upon the experiences of other movements, but more importantly, and I think this is probably one of the most important part about building a movement, we are part of those movements. You know, uh, and you know, one of the words, the phrases that I hate is outreach, because outreach delivers the message that I'm here and you're there, as opposed to us being next to each other. And so, for example, you know, I've spent a lot of time working now, within the women's movement, not as an ally, but because you know, that's a part of the movement that I'm in. I grew up in the civil rights movement and, and in the LGBT movement. And you know, for example, when you look at the photographs that uh, were used as examples of the LGBT movement, actually, those were ACT UP photos. Mm. You know, th those were actually AIDS activists. And in fact, everyone except you know, uh, uh, the, the person in the front of those photos are all men who are dead now. They're all my friends, and that was an ACT UP movement. And the thing that's critical about that, if you look at the modern LGTB movement, including the marriage equality movement, it was built on the backs of the AIDS movement. You know, if you look at the first march in Washington, not the first, the second march in Washington in 1987, which is the first march where we really talked about HIV and AIDS, and you looked at the budgets and the size of the organizations, and one of the key messages of that march was about HIV and AIDS. Uh, and so all of, the, all of that movement was built on that work. So it's both about sharing and learning for other movements, but most importantly, it's, a, it's about being a part of those movements because we are inextricably connected. Are there challenges sometimes though? Because there have been moments where the women's movement, some in the women's movement wanted to very careful, carefully delineate their work from the civil rights movement. There are some in the civil rights movement who say that the LGBT movement is different that it's that you know they chafe when people say that is a modern civil rights movement because they think well wait a minute that's different than what we do and a lot of people disagree with that so there are, are there challenges to make sure that that people do share information and do work together and, and are able to draw lessons from the past yes uh, <clears throat> I, I have an example of movement work from North Carolina in North Carolina we have the forward together moral movement and uh, I was arrested for the 18th time at the legislature uh, we had 150 organizations in North Carolina, uh, gay rights, uh, environment, uh, education, voting rights, labor, faith, and so forth. And each one of the, what used to be silos and people working on their own issue are now working on all the issues together. And when they wanted to change the constitution in North Carolina to outlaw equal marriage, Reverend Barber, who is a black 
an evangelical minister from <coughs> North Carolina. They thought that that would split the movement, but he took the lead in fighting against that uh, constitutional amendment uh, and brought together a huge movement in North Carolina. They changed the NAACP policy in North Carolina, and he led very brief on the board of the national NAACP to change their policy on equal marriage and s on the grounds that you could not and should not put in constitutions discriminatory clauses or uh, measures of any kind, period. So uh, we led that fight there, and it was not very long before uh, President Obama publicly changed his position on it. So we have taken up that battle, not as a silo, but each person takes up that, uh, that cause. And this fight for equal marriage in North Carolina and also p participated in the state of New York has uh, challenged all of the uh, uh, organizational uh, lessons that we learned in the civil rights movement, but we're bringing them to the present. Alice Watson. Most of the work that we do today, you know, first looks at the civil rights movement of the late 50s and 60s. When I first started Southern Echo, people that was working with me said the first thing we're going to have to do is look at what SNCC and other organizations in the early 60s did so we can profit by their mistakes and we won't make them in this day and time. So there's a direct relationship with that. And that goes beyond Southern Echo because, for example, I am a mentor of Greg Johnson, who is the state NAACP president. And there are a number of others that I have mentored, like one over here, Eric Leslie. But the civil rights movement made many mistakes. And I didn't want us to fall victims of that mistake. For example, in Southern, Southern Echo now does not take leadership out of local communities and send them on a statewide level. I realized that was a mistake that we made in SNCC to a great degree because I said to myself, I said, what would uh, the Delta be like today if Fannie Lou Hamer had been left to work in her area most or much of the time? What would Southwest Mississippi be like if I had been left to work in South Mississippi most of the time? So we took that out. Today in our movement and our work, we don't take the leaders out and leave the local communities bare, null, and void. And the other thing is that we didn't know what organizing was. We thought we were organizing real early, but most of the work we did was mobilizing. And if you don't understand and know the difference between mobilizing and organizing, then uh, you're going to come up short on the stick. So the work we are doing in Mississippi and teaching and working with people throughout, especially the South, you know, has a direct connection to the work that we did in the early 60s. I okay. hope I hope you all are taking notes so you know the difference between mobilizing and organizing and many other things. And also remember to pass your questions toward the center where usher, ushers will be picking them up and then we'll be able to put those questions. Chris. Uh, we were, the LGBTQ movement was absolutely sort of foundational in what ended up being one court case in California but it's really important to remember the three branches of government and the, the, the fact that we had to sue our state for protection under the federal constitution was a response to the majority of Californians voting against our constitutional rights. They had been delivered through a number of other efforts inside the state, but then they were overturned in, a, in an election by a popular vote. So without the ability to essentially sue my state, I would have been left as a minority 
oppressed by the majority who had decided that my relationship was not as good as somebody else's relationship. What's so remarkable about the system we live in, the government we live in is, yes, there are movements. Yes, it's important to push back. I, I, we wouldn't have even had the, the wherewithal to have a court case had it not been for all that effort. But every once in a while, you have to sort of strike out of the larger group and do something that's really quite risky. There were many in the movement and still are who believed it was too soon for us to challenge the state of California, that there was a state-by-state -state strategy and we went outside of that, that strategic thinking and did something very risky. You can lose a court case. Um, and we were, we were very nervous and concerned about that. But I think it's really important to remember that within a movement, there are multiple strategies operating all at, par at exactly the same time. There might be a court strategy, there might be an electoral strategy, there might be um, a grassroots organizing, mobilizing strategy, and frankly, if all of those things are operating simultaneously, the more likely you are to see the results you saw last summer at the Supreme Court when finally all the marriage bans in the United States of America were struck down by the, by the Supreme Court because they knew that the majority of Americans wanted it that way. They weren't going to do it as soon as we hoped they would two years earlier. It was not yet clear. So how important is timing? <laughs> timing is really important, but you know what else is really important is skill. Um, and there were people involved at the, it, for decades who were tremendously skillful organizers. That there were also really skillful lawyers periodically intervening to challenge certain laws. Don't forget, only 15 years ago, it was a, considered a criminal act to be gay. Criminal act. Don't forget that our president, if his parents had traveled to Virginia to be married, would have been charged with a crime. And in 15 other states and as well. And in 15 other states. It is absolutely remarkable that even with the civil rights movement, there needed to be legal challenges to laws uh, that were horribly oppressive and we had to move from a criminalization of love, like in the loving case, to the validation of love in the, in the Windsor case and in the Obergefell cases. And all of us are benefiting because those laws got struck down and there was a society ready to live differently. And, yeah. and, and Michelle, before we move away from your question, there are two things that I also think are critically important. Your question mm -hmm. about movements and mm -hmm. now the relationship between them. One uh, is to meet people where they are. You know, and you know, not everybody is ready to do everything that you want them to do or you think they should do. But almost everybody is ready to do something. You know, and so meeting people where they are is critically important. And that's been critically important in our work with faith-based organizations, for example. And so when we work <coughs> with faith-based organizations, you know, they may not be ready to take on all of our agenda, and I don't care about that. But I'm trying to find the one thing, or even the half thing, that they're willing to take on. Because once you can meet people where they are, they can move forward. But if you don't meet them, they can't move forward. The and, second, and that's a very, that's a, in a true Chicago tradition. That's right. If you can't get a meal, take a sandwich. That's right. Like if I can't have everything, right. I'm gonna get something. That's right, exactly <laughs> right. And, and the second thing is that everybody is an ally. Not everybody knows it yet, you know. But everybody is an ally. But is that you know, true? Is everybody? I, I, and the reason why I say that is that what do I gain by assuming that you're an adversary? Now, I don't mean to be naive. Mm -hmm. And that's why I understand that not everybody understands it yet, you know, that they're an ally. And part of my job is to help them understand that they're an ally. Uh, and that's a critical part of it. And, and this, is an, this is an example that, you know, for example, when we talked about what happened you know, with, with the NAACP and the minister, we could have assumed that he wasn't going to be an ally, or we could assume that he was going to be an ally. You know, uh, I've had a number of experiences. One, for example, is a friend of yours, George Curry, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who wrote an article, a column around, he was debating whether or not marriage equality. And he literally did kind of a debate. And people attacked him and attacked him and attacked him, but no one called him. So I flew to Washington, D.C., you know, and I walked into George's office in Howard, and I said, I want to talk to you, you know. And I assumed that he was going to be a friend. You know, I actually had never met him, had never spoken to him. 
Today, George has, has covered HIV and AIDS more than almost any other journalist in the country. You know, he's traveled with us all over the world. You know, he has become kind of someone that pushes me rather than my pushing him, in part because I assumed that he was going to be an, a an ally instead of an adversary. Now, Mr. Can Watson, I'm going to hear from you in just a second, but I just want to add one thing, one, one perhaps observation. Is part of that outlook, assuming that everyone is an ally, um, even taking people who might be adversaries and turning that around. So even if you are an adversary, you might make me stronger. Um, and that's how you might be an ally, that you know, when you face resistance, that's how you build muscles. Is that part of that, that thinking also? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Mr. Watson. I just want to say, you reminded me, brought me back to community organizing. See, as I've analyzed and come to know, the very first rule in community organizing is to never assume never assume because when you assume, you open the door for negative consequences to come in, you know, which I found that out. The other thing I want to just briefly mention is the importance of timing. In Mississippi, after the census were taken in 1990, Southern Echo got involved in a whole redistricting process. As a result of our redistricting process, we had some courts that was backing us as a part of that process. We were able to increase the number of blacks in the state legislature from 21 to 42. We didn't have to use the, 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 uh, the court process. We just threatened. They knew that the Voting Rights Act was there. But when you look at today, all of the areas that didn't use that redistricting process to the fullest of its extent have lost all of that now because they have gutted the Voting Rights Act. You can't no longer submit to the Justice Department and get the kind of results. So if we had not done that, then at that particular time, then we would have still been left with just a handful of black state legislators in Mississippi. So timing so is very important. I just want to ask, if they could start moving the questions forward, I can start to look at them, because I'd like to include the audience. So if you want to pass some of the questions forward, I can start to go through those also. What Hollis just said about the redistricting uh, reminds me that just yesterday, the federal district court in North Carolina struck down the entire uh, right-wing uh, redistricting of uh, North Carolina. And uh, they would not have, we would not have been able to have that success in the federal court yesterday. One of the most important voting rights uh, act, uh, trials uh, in recent history. And I'm sure they haven't been covering that uh, in big uh, headline news. But uh, that's a tremendous ad, um, advance. But that was not possible without long years of grassroots organizing. And we're mobilizing now for next Saturday the 13th. And I'll tell you that we are likely to have 80 to 100,000 or more people in Raleigh, North Carolina. We already had that once before. And we've had over 1,000 people arrested at the legislature in Raleigh, North Carolina. And very few people in the United States know about it because they've kept a blackout on what's happening in North Carolina where the extreme right has taken over one of the most progressive of the southern states and has taken it in education, for instance, from about 15th and the best southern state in education to 48th in the country in just 24 months. And our teachers are being devastated. Our educational system is being devastated by a right wing takeover of the House, the Senate, and the governorship. And we have grassroots organizing for six or eight years, and now we're having hundreds of thousands of people, 60% of them white Southerners, ready to go to jail. I was one of the first uh, 17 arrested, and since then over 1,000 have been arrested at the legislature in Raleigh. Have you heard about that? I don't think so. You need to know about that. A huge victory just yesterday. So we've talked about mobilization and organization and synergy, I want to talk a little bit about language and narrative also. How important is it to build a narrative around the movement? Who helps build the narrative? 
And do words in themselves count? I mean, I'm thinking of the, the term movement. Um, there was a time when there was a lot of, in the civil rights movement, there was a little bit of push and pull. And for some people who were um, uncomfortable, older African Americans who were uncomfortable with the notion of the movement because it sounded radical, um, there was a suggestion that people stop necessarily calling it a movement but just talk about doing what's right. Because if you're talking about doing what's right, it doesn't matter what label you attach to it, you were guided by something larger. So if we could just talk a little bit about narrative and language. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll start off there because it is, om is sort of having a narrower view on the LGBTQ movement through the marriage movement. There was a, it was contemplated from the very onset of filing that case that the optics and frankly the narrative were as important as what happened in the courtroom. Hmm. As you know, there were no cameras in the courtroom. It was, it was not possible for the majority of people to even see what was going on, on during our trial. But we initially um, realized that the important thing to do, number one, was neutralize the, the partisanship that had been basically shrouded the, the whole effort on marriage equality as a left-leaning issue. We had David Boys and Ted Olson, two of the most prominent Re Republican and Democratic lawyers in the country today, at least as, in, as it pertains to the Supreme Court. They teamed up to fight our case, and they became sort of a new voice in the movement for fairness and equality and for protection under the 14th Amendment, and they were the experts. So on their that. partnership was important. So this sort of unusual, unusual from the partners extreme. from the two yeah. extremes got together to say, we can agree on this. I mean, much like you said, we may not agree on anything else, but we agree on this. And so they drew a lot of attention to the issue by, by being unusual leaders on it. Second thing was, there was always this possibility that we would lose. And so what was going on simultaneously with whatever's happening in the court process, which took five years, was a concentrated and intense effort to create a narrative. It wasn't left to chance. There was a group of folks, primarily, actually the initial funders of our case, were Hollywood movie directors and producers who know all about storytelling. And that seems really odd, but in some ways I think they were really successful in getting lots of people to develop a so, point of view. So even a show like Modern Family. Yes, right. You know, does, that makes a difference in terms of bringing a, a message difference. to... The, the um, more images and impressions there are of folks that living a life that we're trying to live, helps people imagine that it's okay versus it's, it, there's, there's no image whatsoever other than the lots of negative images which we are all very familiar with. So LGBTQ individuals and couples are often portrayed as really troubled people. In fact, I think the reason we lost the election in California is we were portrayed as predatory and, um, and unsafe adults to have children around. That's how they won that election. And that is, so you have to counter that narrative with one that's positive and affirmative. And that is the narrative now, I think, around marriage, is that it's an inclusive, positive, life-affirming institution, whereas before it may have seemed a little old and obsolete, not all that interesting, and very exclusive. I think that we've been able to bring some life back to that institution by letting more people be a part of it. Bob Zellner. The narrative uh, is very, very important, and we have developed one in North Carolina. I, I hate to keep going back to that. Uh, we, in fact, we wrote a book about it, and it's just been published. It's called The Third Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So the way that we look at today's fusion politics in North Carolina, which is spreading around the country, to bring all these issues together across all kinds of lines, intersectionality, the way that we narrate that is we say the first reconstruction after the end of slavery was ended by violence when uh, poor whites and blacks had gotten together to make uh, con uh, very progressive constitutions, especially in the southern states. Now that was overturned by violence. The second reconstruction, the civil rights movement, was also overturned in some sense by right-wing violence. We never thought that women's rights would be challenged again after the Civil Rights Movement. We never thought that we would want to go back to an all-white ballot box. Uh, we never thought that labor rights or any of those things would be seriously challenged, and we're being challenged at every turn. So we're in the third reconstruction. That's part of the narrative. And we have to get out, we have to win this reconstruction fu fusion politics. LBGTQ strugglers together, Aid strugglers together, old civil rights people, women, immigrants, uh, 
new economics and so forth, all of that comes together in a new fusion movement, and that's our narrative. We're going to win, we're going in a progressive direction, not a backward one. So I, wanna, I just wanna ask if I can, because you've talked about fusion movements, but sometimes there are fissures within movements. So in the civil rights movement, we know that women were marginalized. Even when they came to the March on Washington, when they marched to the Lincoln Memorial, the men walk, marched on one avenue, and the women were several blocks away marching separately on another avenue. In um, the HIV AIDS movement, there is not always parity in terms of funding for people of color and funding for the people who are in the as of now majority population. So if we can talk a little bit about fissures within movements, and we'll talk about how you deal with those things and confront those things. And some of that is driven because the narrative is too narrow and the optics are off. You know, uh, so if you use the example of the HIV AIDS movement and a movement that you know, originally was perceived you know, as a white gay male movement because all the images, you know, including the one we show today, uh, were white men. You know, uh, and so that created a narrative you know, uh, that even as we began to understand you know, the wide implications of HIV and AIDS, the, the language of the changing face of the AIDS epidemic was destructive because it was a lie. You now, in the earliest days of the epidemic, 25% of the epidemic from the very beginning were black. You know, we talk about you know, the first six cases in Dr. Michael Gottlieb were white men, but we don't talk about the next five cases you know, who were black. No, no, we talk about the impact of women. From the very beginning of counting the AIDS epidemic, over 70% of the women living with HIV and AIDS in this country were black. Now, so there wasn't a changing face of the epidemic. And what that, hap what, what, what that did in black communities is that when we first start talking about AIDS in black communities, people would talk about it's not our problem. No, or there was a reaction that said they're not gonna blame this on us. Uh, and we still see the legacy no, of that mis no, dis disruption because the narrative is wrong and the optics were too narrow, where we've made tremendous advances. No, and yet, when we look at black and brown and young communities, we see an epidemic that's continuing to go on. Two weeks ago in the New York Times, there was a story that talked about we haven't seen, we haven't seen impacts on life expectancy since the end of the AIDS epidemic two decades ago. Now, and so in my world, if we're talking about Black Lives Matter, what AIDS epidemic ended two, two decades ago when I get calls every single day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the, the having a narrative that is expansive and inclusive, having an optics that accurately reflects the, the, the issue at hand, actually you know, reduces the likelihood of fissures because fissures often happen because the narrative is misdirected. Okay, I'm gonna ask us to, I'm gonna just move on because the, the questions from the audience are excellent and I want to be able to get to some of these. And, um, and so Hollis, I'm gonna actually ask you the first question because Megan Osborne, um, who is from the Delta, uh, Delta 2011, and this is for you. Um, segregated schools are still a reality in the Deep South and throughout the country. Why did the Civil Rights Movement fail to solve this problem? The Civil Rights Movement failed to solve that problem because that problem was much larger than the civil rights movement. There were people, had they got involved with Are the people civil, snapping rights, fingers? civil <laughs> rights movement, then had they gotten involved, more of these problems would have been solved. When you look at that problem today, we can also ask ourselves, why is it that we today, with all of our movements, and the work that we are doing have not had a greater impact on those. Part of it has to do with not having the proper narrative because having the proper narrative helps to free us or it also the other side of it helps to put us further in bondage. Not having the proper narrative allows this country to use the Trinity on us. And when I say the Trinity, I'm not talking about the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about a method of process that can and does be emphasized and executed mostly with the military, but they bring it to home. 
The trinity that I'm talking about is where those who are dominating and control identify you as the enemy, then they isolate you as the enemy, and then they move in and annihilate you. They tried to do that with us in the civil rights movement by calling all of us in the civil rights movement outside agitating communists. I didn't even know what a communist meant, you know, but that's what it was done. And you can see it once they do that and get people not believing in you, not willing to work with you, then they come in and destroy you. And okay. they use that same language today with the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, the exact same language. They haven't even updated the language. So let me let me get to it. I, we have great questions, so I'm sorry. I'm just going to move on to another yeah. question. And I for, forgive me, Avery, if I mispronounce your last name. This is from Avery. I think it's Aguina, um, DFW 12. What kind of maintenance is required following big wins for a movement, i.e. the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Supreme Court marriage rights case, especially given that big wins are always followed by resistance? How do we keep moving forward while we have to keep looking back to ensure change actually happens to ensure change and implement, implementation? So what needs to happen after a victory? Well, after a victory, we need to reaffirm that we need a total changeover. We, instead of just uh, fixing around the edges, we have to have a total changeover in this country. We need a peaceful, nonviolent, democratic revolution in this country. That means that we can use the word socialist, we can use the word communist, we can develop new paradigms of economies and we do not have to be stuck in the past. For us to have a right-wing country the most uh, richest country in the world, not to be able to solve problems of education. In Mississippi, for goodness sake, most of the school boards, especially in the Delta, are white people who do not send their kids to public school. Why would they put any money into those schools? They go to segregation academies. So let me ask a question to follow that. This is from Charlotte. Uh, she's from the Ruth Mesfun Excellent Girls Charter School. How do you increase the people in the movement who are not directly affected by it? How do you bring them into I'll, the movement? I'll, I'll repeat. How do you increase the people in the movement who are not directly affected by it? How so do you bring people how, into the movement who are not directly affected by yes. it? Who is not directly affected by it? I'm not sure. <laughs> and if you look at that, you need to have, we first have to have the right understanding and the proper vision how we see it, be able to transmit that information to others. But if we understand it, I can say to any of, of our people that there is nothing that directly affects us adults that don't directly or indirectly affect young people and vice versa. So we all are affected. It's just that we don't have the proper comprehension as to what is happening to know how we are affected. So it's a whole educational piece that has to take place, which is the second step of the four steps in doing community organizing. But I, I think that Ruth is asking another question you know, as well, particularly as it relates to race and gender and sexual orientation and what, and what have you, and certainly that we've experienced in the AIDS movement, uh, the whole notion is nothing about us without us. You know, uh, I'm a black gay man living with AIDS. I run an AIDS organization. You know, I'm just not a policymaker. I'm a consumer. You know, that this is a part of my life. And how do you make sure you know, that in all of our, our movements, you know, even though maybe all of us are impacted by all of our movements, some of us are more <laughs> impacted, more directly, you know, more acutely. And, to, and, and part of the way that you do that is you never leave those communities. You never leave those spaces. It goes back to you know, you know, pulling Fannie Yulu Hamer out. You know, leave her in. And so if our work is grounded, if we're always present, if we make sure that we don't move forward without bringing along all of us who are most acutely impacted, that's how you grow the movement and, uh, in, in that fashion. So someone who's not black, not gay, not affected by HIV or AIDS, 
bringing them into the movement. What do you think of the concept of empathy? Is that offensive to you, or is that what is required? No, I don't think that it, it's offensive. And actually, I don't think it's just it's all rooted on, on empathy. Quite frankly, I think the first analysis that suggests that we're all impacted, whether you, know, whether you are black or white or Asian or Latino, whether you're old or white or straight or gay, I believe that what's happening with black folks and AIDS impacts all of us. You know, and so I, I, the, 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 the other folks that work with us, you know, it's, it's not about charity. You know, I believe that all of our lives are inextricably connected, and that's a core part of how you build and grow the movement. So we're talking to educators, a question about education. How can we teach movements as part of our history curriculum in schools without being labeled subversive? I, I'd like to start on that one. When I started teaching the, uh, the history of the Civil Rights Movement at, at uh, Long Island University, Southampton College in Long Island, uh, I taught freshmen who were going to go to other countries and do three years of their work elsewhere. And those American students needed to be taught about the Civil Rights Movement because they were going to go to countries that knew more about our Civil Rights Movement than our own young people. And I would ask them, who do you know from the Civil Rights Movement when they came into the class? And they'd say, oh, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X. Uh, <laughs> so there you've got it right there. We don't teach this history. And if we did teach this history, the proud history of women's struggle, of gay struggle, of all of these struggles that we've had in our communities, our young people wouldn't be out here saying, I'm going to pop a cap in your ass. They would be respecting each other and not shooting each other, I'll tell you that for sure. So how do you do it? How do you bring that into the classroom? I know that you all aren't educators, but I assume that you have some ideas about Well, this. I don't think it all has to come from you, the teacher. There are uh, lots of other uh, places where these stories exist. I think introducing theater, or the, I think the arts are a tremendously yes. important. Yes. Um, the, the arts community has done a lot to lift up struggles. Yep through a variety of means. So I think you can be really creative and look for, for ways of conveying these important stories, whether they're about individuals or groups or over long periods of time, without it coming out of your mouth. You know, let me tell you all about this. Um, we were really fortunate in our case to have people involved in it who were playwrights. There's a play that's literally, they just took the transcript from our trial and put it into binders and asked actors, and now it's, it's been actually redone mm -hmm. by high schools and colleges all over the world where the students stand on the stage in front of their parents and in front of the school administration and they, they read the words that came out of the mouths of our lawyers and out of our expert witnesses and out of those of us who were the plaintiffs. And there are ways to sort of transfer the message from you to the students themselves through, I think, I think through the arts and letting them express themselves a little bit differently. The arts, good idea. I think that it's important at least for folks in this room to understand that education is the most important social justice movement. You know, that the reason why the right you know, is attacking education is that they win when we're ignorant. You know, you know they are incentivized you know, to dismantle education. You know, and so I, I think that part of it is understanding that. I also think that part of it is looking at that question in a different way. You know, um, we shouldn't run away from being labeled subversive. We should be subversive in, uh, yeah. uh, in an unjust Teach society. Teach subversively. Teach subversively. You know, and, and part of movement building is being bold and not being shy and not being afraid you know, of the things that they call you uh, and the tax that they lay upon you because a lot of that happens out of their desperation. I think we also have to define that for ourselves, not that but just a lot of other terms that we are called that people have defined for us. And we have to get to the point where we define them terms for ourselves, you define it that way, and that takes us directly to the masses of people. We must understand as teachers that the classroom in the public school, the classroom in the charter school is not the only classroom. We can create and build classrooms in the community and we can teach it there because 
those who have given us access has a different attitude towards that which we are trying to do. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal balls for this next question and look into the future. Can any of you, or actually the, 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 the current um, situation that we find ourselves in, can any of you identify an effective social change movement that is not getting enough attention right now? So something that we don't know as much about as we should. I am deeply concerned about reproductive rights and um, yeah. frankly, women having power over their own bodies, which I can't believe we have to be as terrified as we have to be right now that That's it is right. really, really, really difficult for women, particularly in southern states, to have access to basic health care, access to reproductive health care, and to be, frankly, to have laws put between them and their bodies is really unacceptable and the fight has been going on for almost 50 years and I don't think we're necessarily more done with that fight than we were when Roe, when we got the Roe ruling and, it, and I'm deeply troubled by that. Are there, there are other movements that are not represented on this stage. Um, people who are fighting for social movements or political change from a more conservative perspective um, from the other side of the aisle in terms of reproductive rights, um, in terms of voting rights. If you looked at people who are not represented here and who represent some, who are part of those movements, is there something that you, I don't, I, I'm careful not to use the word respect or perhaps admire in terms of tactics that are being used in those movements? I have a, a, maybe a short one on that. Uh, the, uh, the movement in the Native American community and the indigenous peoples communities around the world are very, very important. And uh, one of the things that uh, many churches are doing now and other places is trying to repudiate the doc doctrine of discovery. Somebody recently told me about the doctrine of discovery. I've been in the civil rights movement for 50 years. I didn't know what they were talking about. And that is that white people, Christians, came here and discovered land. And well, there were some humans here, but since the white Christians discovered it, they could do what they wanted to with it. And it's, uh, that uh, doctrine of discovery has led our country into manifest destiny, genocide against the Native Americans, uh, and all other indigenous people in, around the world have been dispossessed because of that. And a lot of the NGOs and a lot of the uh, foundations and so forth around the world are continuing that dispossession of indigenous people in the name of development, reconstruction, rebuilding, and so forth. Every national natural disaster now around the country, they go in for uh, reconstruction and development, and in the process, they take more land away from the indigenous people. So we need to challenge the... Uh, doctrine of discovery and end it for all time. Okay, and the question about something that you would admire in an, an organization that's not, or a movement that's not represented on the stage here. Right, um, I guess I'm gonna translate that, <laughs> late that into you know, what's happening on the right uh, that, that, that I would say I would respect, and, and probably what I would respect in that regard, and I think that we should be students of it, is you know, the grass, you know, roots work that's going on. So for example, we get energized at a presidential election level, you know, uh, but you know, the backbench happens at school board elections, you know, at a college board that's election. Right. You know, that's where you know, the real work happens. And quite frankly, all change happens locally. You know? And so we get riled up every four years, and yet the right is you know, flooding our school boards and flooding our college boards and Coke flooding our, 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 our city council. And so I think that we should pay attention uh, to that uh, and in a very ser serious way. Uh, and not to pander, but to your other question, because I believe this deeply, that I think the most important movement that is not getting enough attention is quite frankly education. You know, because you know, um, we can't win you know, if folks aren't educated. And on the issue of allies and what have you, you know, education is key to that. And there's a reason why there's a dismantling of public education. It's not by accident, it is strategic. No, they win when we're ignorant. 
Okay, this you cannot just, privatize it. I okay. would just like to say the young people in general, whatever it is, wherever you are, most of the time do not recognize and get the kind of credit that they do. And part of that is related to them realizing how much work and the progress that was made mostly by young people back in the late 50s and 60s. So your stuff don't get publicized because they don't want you motivating and inspiring other young people to do what you know need to be done, starting right in your backyard. Okay, this question is from Allison Bajrakara. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, in Los Angeles. Um, you spoke a little bit to this, the question of turning everyone into an ally, but she wants to know if any of you can speak to experiences where you successfully moved a foe into an ally. Can I do a short one on that? Mm -hmm. All right, then okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do and a And then short. you'll do a short um, <coughs> When I, I, I went to work as the first white field secretary for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In 1967, it became necessary for people, white people <coughs> in SNCC to start organizing white people in the Deep South. We organized GROW, grassroots organizing work, which we also called Get Rid of Wallace, my uh, George, George Wallace. Wallace of Alabama. <laughs> we went directly to Klan areas and so forth, and we began to work with poor and working class white Southerners on the basis of bringing them into joint work with the movement that had been organized in the black community for so many years, where there was so much skill and so much knowledge of how to get things done. And they began to work with the black community, especially in Mississippi, Laurel, Mississippi. We had former Klansmen working together with Susie Ruffin, who was the head of the movement in Laurel, Mississippi. And they began to work together and as they worked together, they began to change their hearts and their minds, and they began to um, work together so much that they had a working person's uh, campaign in Laurel, Mississippi, to uh, elect black and white officials of a new fusion movement in uh, Laurel, Mississippi, and that was in 1972. Okay. Mr. Watkins, you have a short one, too? Yes. In, in Mississippi, our governor at one time wanted to reduce the size of the state legislature. Had they done that, it would have practically completely eliminated most all of the blacks. In addition to that, it would have also made it impossible for women to be elected. So we put out a brochure about this. And when one of the most racist organizations in Mississippi saw that this was going to happen, they contacted us and said, we are rural. We deal with agriculture. We need to make sure that a lot of our women stay there. And they joined in with us, and the governor had to bow his head and submit because too many people was against him. I had a really unique experience um, as a witness in this trial of staring into the eyes of the lawyers on the other side for three weeks. And one in particular, the lead attorney for the other side, was, was adamantly against any change to marriage laws, very much a proponent of traditional marriage. And what he didn't realize while he was arguing that case was that one of his daughters was going to come out to him. Oh while he was appealing the case all the way to the Supreme Court. And despite that fact, um, at the end of the whole thing, we got a call that, that he and his wife wanted to have my wife and I over for dinner. Yeah. I realized I didn't give the name of that organization. <laughs> It was, it was the Mississippi Farm Bureau. Okay. It's the most racist organization in Mississippi <laughs> as you can have. But they wanted to know if they could use our material and help us get it out to all and, of and, the and, and, and that has been a rock in your shoe for like decades, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, and I, and I just want to say one more thing about that. So <laughs> I actually totally relate to what just happened. I, I have that. I wish I had said healing all the time. Mm. But we went to dinner at their home. They could not have been warmer and more caring. And he, and he looked in our eyes and said, I just want you to know, when I listened to your testimony and I saw the pain in your face and your own mother crying and your own children crying, I realized that you were moving me too. Mm. And mm. that will affect mm. his own family, but it also affects our family, that, that we know that we made that impact on him. And it reminded me of this other person who came out of the blue one day and said, I just want you to know, I'm not gay, my kids aren't gay, but I haven't, as as I know. And I, but I haven't <laughs> met my grandkids yet. I haven't met my grandkids yet. And I think that would apply to so many of the issues we're talking about here is, you don't know who you don't know and how much you're going to love them and how much you're gonna want for them to have a full and, and complete and protected life. Not only do you not know who you don't know, often you don't know who you do know. Uh, and that is part of the story. <laughs> My, yeah. I'm gonna probably get into trouble on this one, uh, but um, a number of years ago, there was, <laughs> there was, a number of years ago, there was a documentary out about HIV and AIDS where Bishop T.D. Jakes talked about how AIDS was not um, his business. Uh, and that he was in the business of uh, saving souls, you know, and AIDS was not a part of that. Um, and uh, a number of years later, we worked with, you know, Bishop Jakes, who is someone who I have come to respect and love deeply, uh, and he gave a sermon, and I was in Potter's house when he gave this sermon, and he said uh, in the sermon that uh, we can't save their souls if we can't save their lives and kind of the movement you know, of how he travels because some of us you know, assumed that, assume that some of us did not assume that he was an adversary, that believed that he was an ally uh, and met him where he was. We could go on, but I wanna, um, in closing, ask you to think about something that perhaps will give us all a bit that we should think about. Movement work is difficult. It can affect your health. It can affect your mind. Um, people who lead movements, people who are active in movements are so busy looking out for others that they don't always take care of themselves. We all know people who um, have health issues that they ignore because they're busy keeping the eye on the movement or trying to push the rock for some other reason or for, for some other person on some other person's behalf. So I want you, if you can, to talk um, a little bit as we sort of round the corner to closing about what people in the movement need. Okay, you've been talking about what the movement needs. I want you to talk about what people in the movement need by way of support. And I want you to be specific. What can people do if you don't have time? Um, what can you do to help those who are giving their time, giving of themselves, giving of their spirits, giving, giving, giving all the time so that they're moving forward but their tank is actually on empty? I could do a short one on that. Uh, within, within the thir first 36 months of my work with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, starting in 1961, at least six of our comrades were murdered. They were lynched, they were killed in Mississippi and Alabama and other parts of the South because they wanted to register people to vote. There was a tremendous number of people who came out of that struggle after years and years of being in the struggle with post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder. And many of us have uh, suffered from that. We've been through drugs, we've been through alcoholism and all kinds of things. Thank goodness for 12-step programs and the love of God. But. Uh, what we need to do is understand that we have to take care of each other and uh, we have to understand one of the things that uh, is often said about the movement and I, one of the things I'd like to at least put in an, another side of it is uh, in SNCC, women were not marginalized in uh, the sense that they may have been in SELC and some of the other organizations. One time, one of the big SELC people sa said, all of the leaders of this uh, civil rights movement were preachers. 
And I said, did that apply to Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, to Mrs. Ella Baker, to uh, uh, Diane Nash, Rosa Parks, you name the, you name the women. They were responsible for the movement. They organized the movement, and they were some of our main leaders in that movement. So, so and what uh, did they need? Yeah. What, what is it, I wanted you to, to bring you back to that question of yeah. what people in the movement need that, that they don't even articulate themselves. Well, one of the things that we do need in the movement, and a lot of people, well, I'm 77 uh, in April, I'll be 77. And uh, luckily I have enough health that uh, recently I walked 283 miles in 14 days because we had to save 283 rural hospitals across the country. Now everybody doesn't have that level of health in our movement. And we have never been able to have any kind of structure built up that would uh, honor uh, veterans of the movement and give them any kind of pension or any kind of health care. So uh, a lot of people have just suffered in silence. When we talk about the people who integrated the schools, for instance, we usually think of they integrated the schools and everybody lived happily ever after. There was a tremendous amount of trauma of, uh, uh, visited upon those young students that went into those schools and that kind of trauma has never been either recognized or dealt with, and it needs to be dealt with in some way. We need to feel a level of comfort from the people who are the generations that are coming after us to take care of some of us old people, generally. Thank you. And, be and before, we, before we get old, I would suggest that people that you support, people that you love, find someone that can talk to them about their diet. We are eating ourselves to death. A diet. Our diet. A diet. Because you can and die from a bad diet. And <laughs> what I'm saying is that we are eating ourselves to death rather than eating ourselves to yep. life and good health. So if we would do that, and we will also help ourselves, because in most cases that I'm trying to teach so-and-so to do this, and I'm not even doing it myself. Mm -hmm. So now you start doing it, and you take them out different places. But the whole eating thing, you know, so we, Chris? we, we really need to deal with I, I agree with everything everybody else has said. I would just say when you're hearing people complain about a leader anywhere, whether it's your principal or it's somebody on a school board or it's somebody – in your personal life, or they're leading an organization you're a member of, if you hear people complaining about a leader, just take a moment and realize how difficult it is to be a leader, and that everybody's criticisms are tearing down some of the energy they're putting into what they're trying to lead. I am in no way defending people that are leading on the wrong thing, but I do think there's a unique set of skills and uh, exhaustion that come from trying to be the leader of any good effort. So just, I, I hear a lot of, I did while we were plaintiffs hear people complaining about so many things within the LGBTQ movement. Who was a good leader, leader? Who was a bad leader? We should follow them. We shouldn't follow them. Why are they contradicting them? And at some point I thought, we're being harder on each other than anybody outside of our movement is being uh, to, to us. And so I just feel like there's really something to examine about how we treat each other within whatever movement we're in and how do we hold up the right people and then sort of in, in a really rational, objective and respectful way, move leaders out of the way that aren't leading in the way we want versus complaining about them. In well, that's really powerful. Even in that moment where you're hearing the yeah, complaint, yeah. well, you know, what sort would of, you, is what, what do you think if you go all like almost Minnesotan on them, what do you think would make them a better leader? I'm from Minnesota, so yeah. I can say that. <laughs> What, what do you think that, do? you know, what can right. you do Is to make them... needs, you know, what could we do to support them to help them be a better leader because they've already taken these steps, are already taking this risk, they're already making this sacrifice, or they have lots of other skills. There are just a few areas where we wish they were a little bit better. I think there's something we, I don't know why it is, that something becomes very fractured or sort of, there's a, there's a tension built into leaders versus everybody else, but it's a really special thing. To, to take on the leadership of any effort. And there are people on this stage who have been doing it for so long and are so good at it that I bet there are people who have asked, you know, why you, why not me? Why do you get to say that and I don't? And I, I just think there's something really important to pay attention to about 
the people that, that go through the hard work they need. Oh. Well, I think that to the answer kind of answer to your question, what can we do, you can pitch in. You know, rather than stand back and throw a stone, why don't you pitch in and give a hug? You know, uh, and so I think that one of the things that people in the movement need you know, is for us to be kinder and gentler to each other uh, and for us to pitch in as opposed to throw stones. But I also think that there's some practical things that people in the movement need. You know, one is that we should be passionate about making sure that all of us you know, are trained and skilled and get the education that we need. Uh, and they were constantly pushing you know, for education. You know. in, in our organization, for example, and we're a tiny, tiny, tiny organization, you know, that we insist, no matter how difficult it is, that we have an education reimbursement you know, program you know, so that if you join us and you don't have a college degree, we require that you get a college degree. Mm -hmm. And if you have a bachelor's degree, we require that you work on your master's degree. And we will pay to make that happen, so education. I think the other thing is that we can't build a movement when those of us who are doing the work have food insecurity and housing insecurity and no mechanism to retire. And so making sure those things uh, are in place. You know, Where's uh, our social security? <laughs> I mean, that's what I was asking. I wonder if they're a very practical thing. Drop a meal off. Exactly. You know, um, drop a, a, a new comforter. Uh, you know, the things that you when, you, when you feather your own nest, you know, what, what might someone else need? I, I know I'm um, asking the questions and not answering them, but I wonder if I can just add one thing. And this comes to my mind as a journalist and as an author. Um, one of the things that you can do to honor those who give their lives over to any movement is to listen to them. Um, and to see that perhaps as part of your responsibility to document their story in, a, in an official way perhaps, to record their stories, but in an unofficial way, how are you doing? You know, let them download every so often in a very um, informal way uh, to know that someone cares for them and someone really wants to listen. As I said, we could go on, but we have to round the corner to done. And so I'd love to hear um, a very brief closing reflection. We only have about five minutes left from each of you, um, any wisdom that you might want to share with the audience or draw um, all of what we've heard together. Mr. Watkins, let's begin with you again. I was hoping I could be last so I could ask permission to lead us in one or two verses of a, a couple of freedom start. songs. Then, then I'll start and we'll let you, we'll let you end right. if that's what you like. Um, I would say a few things, you know, that beginning with kind of the, um, the premise of the session, you know, uh, successful movements, you know, and, and I would argue at least in the HIV AIDS uh, movement that the jury is still out on whether or not we're successful or not. You know, our goal, you know, is to end the AIDS epidemic, you know, and yes, we've made tremendous advancements, you know, a 20 year old who gets diagnosed today can, and goes on treatment can expect you know, to live into his or her 70s. When I was diagnosed in 1984, my doctors told me you know, to go home uh, and get my affairs in order uh, and get ready to die. My first thought is, I'm 24, I don't have any affairs to get in uh, order. Uh, so we made, pro we, 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 we made progress. You know, today, you know, anyone can find out their HIV test, you know, their status. You know, HIV testing has never been easier. You know, treatment today is easier and faster and more effective. Prevention, we can break the back of the AIDS epidemic. We can stop, you know, transmission of HIV, you know, through treatment as prevention. We can stop acquisition of HIV through PrEP, you know, breaking the back of the epidemic. So we made those advancements. But all of that does not a cure make. You know, some drugs and some medication that work for some folks some of the time, you know, does not a cure make. We're not done. We're not successful. We've had successes until the AIDS epidemic is over. And so one of the things that you do after a big win is to remind yourselves what is the goal. And probably whatever the big win was, that wasn't the goal. You know, it was a step along uh, the way. Uh, and so I think that being mindful of that. And finally, and most importantly, uh, is knowing that you will win. Not just believing that you will win, knowing that you will win. And some of the work we do you know, is not so easy to kind of be in that place. Quite frankly, it's easier 
for me now in the work that I do because not winning means that we die very acutely and very quickly. In the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, literally, you know, 75% of our time was going to funerals or sitting at deathbeds, you know, or burying our friends. You know, so the, the, you know, not knowing that we were going to win you know, would have forced us to just curl up uh, and die, and that would have made too many people happy. Uh, and so knowing that you will win uh, is critically important. Okay, Chris, quick statement. Um, I would just say, uh, by being a great teacher, you're preparing people to grow up and do things like we're doing. Um, you don't know what their fight will be, you don't know what their identity will be, you don't know what the struggle will be, but you're arming them with the ability to think critically and be tenacious and have grit and care about what they, and care about themselves. Those things will let them fight whatever fight they face. And it's, it's really not important what that fight is, it's that they're armed with the ability and the education they need to take that on. And so I think what you're already doing is really the key ingredient that we all share here is that I have a feeling we had teachers who didn't know we were gonna grow up to do this, um, but they really did help us do this. And I'm really happy to be here and, and I really am proud of everything you're doing to arm the next generation to do the next, the next wave of fighting. Thank you, Bob Zellner, quick, quick comment. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, the greatest thing that we can do is to continue the movement. Uh, there are so many things that are happening. In the next two years, we're going to be revitalizing the Poor People's Campaign that was originally uh, organized by Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, Union Theological Seminary and its Poverty Initiative is uh, doing that for the next two years. So Facebook me, and so I can tell you <laughs> about the uh, Poor People's Campaign. Next Saturday in R Raleigh, North Carolina, there's gonna be the greatest civil rights demonstration in the history of the movement in Raleigh, North Carolina, gathering at Shaw University, the founding spot for Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Thousands of people are coming from all over the country. Be there if you can. Uh, the Moral Mondays movement is spreading all over the place and uh, we're organizing every day. The greatest uh, profession that you can do along with all of your other professions is to be an organizer, to be optimistic, and to look to the future, do not look to the past. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hollis Watkins. Yes, and don't buy into the notion that you are just one person. I'm just one person. Because I have not seen anybody that was more than just one person. So have faith in yourself and know that you can do it. So I want to lead us in a couple of freedom songs real quick. You can learn the song in 30 seconds or less. The first Shall we rise? The first, the first song I want to sing is a song that we use to help us to overcome fear. The name of it is Ain't Scared of Nobody Cause I Want My Freedom. <laughs> Let me see the hands of those that know that, uh, that song. Not me. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it to you, <laughs> and we're going to do it. <laughs> Ain't scared of nobody cause I want my freedom. I want my freedom. I want my freedom, ain't scared of nobody, cause I want my freedom, I want my freedom now. That's it, go with it, then I put a verse to it. Ain't scared of nobody, cause I want my freedom, I want my freedom, I want my freedom, ain't scared of nobody, cause I want my freedom, I want my freedom now. But they brought the dogs out and we said, Ain't scared of no dog, cause I want my freedom. I want my freedom. I want my freedom. Ain't scared of no dog, cause I want my freedom. And I want my freedom right now. And then they said, if you don't turn around and go back, we're going to put all of you in jail. And what do you think we said? I ain't scared of nobody, cause I want my freedom, I want my freedom, I want my freedom, I ain't scared of nobody, cause I want my freedom, I want my freedom now. There are a lot of other verses, but we just stop yeah. <laughs> Harmonize out there. All right. The other, the other
other song I want us to sing is a song that we took from Harry Belafonte. You know, in his song, he said, Deo, he said, Deo, eh. Be like, come and we want to go home. All right, say that's good and all that. So, <laughs> we, so we said, freedom, give us freedom. Freedom, come and it won't be long. Won't be long, all right? Won't be long. <laughs> All right, get, get, get your voices, get your voices ready now. Free. <laughs> A little trip on the Greyhound bus, yeah. Freedom coming and it won't be long. Just to fight discrimination and this we must, yeah. Freedom coming and it won't be long. Freedom, freedom, hey. Freedom coming and it won't be long. Well, uh, some says a uh, Peter and some says Paul, yeah. yeah. Freedom coming and it won't be long. Well, it's only one of God that made us all, yeah. yeah. Freedom coming and it won't be long. Freedom, freedom, hey. Freedom coming and it won't be well, the freedom fighters, we were bound in jail. Freedom come and it won't be long. Well, we had no money for to go out there, yeah. Freedom come and it won't be long. But the freedom fighters, we began to shout. Freedom come and it won't be then the jail doors open and we walk out, yeah. Freedom come and it won't be long. Freedom, freedom, hey. Freedom come and it won't be long. This last verse has to do with my practical experience. <laughs> From the movement. Well, if you don't believe that I've been to hell, freedom come and it won't be long. Just a follow me down to that parchment jail. Freedom come and it won't be long. Freedom, freedom, hey. Freedom come and it won't. over there has some little flyers pertaining to my book that's going to be published. And uh, he also has some CDs. <laughs> okay. Songs hey, some of CDs. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And special thank you to Mr. Rockwell. Thank you. Ooh, that was wonderful. Thank you.